Hi, Fabio. Hey, Brandon. How's it going? Good. What uh, you, you're about to present a case in the surgical conference, or have you already made a decision? What's going on here? Yeah, I'm reviewing this case. Um, so it's kind of interesting. It's a 40 ish year old lady with um, left MTS on MRI, and I saw some left enterectal discharges in the temporal region. And um, I think I'm going to indicate and propose the left temporal back to me. Are you, you going to do it yourself this time, like you tried to do the other day? <laughs> that didn't work out too well. No, that's what, fortunate we had a, someone, an expert, to look at it with us. Now, I'm a little concerned about your skills, given the recent history. That I, I, I happen to see Dr. Cole in our show here. Oh, there he is. Hey, guys. How are you doing? Hey, welcome. Welcome, Dr. Cole. Good. Nice to see you. Would you mind taking a look at this EG? Fabio's, you know, honestly, I think he needs to rep repeat the first year. Oh, no. <laughs> Do you want to drive, Dr. Cole? I can give you... Um, Driving privileges. Can I can I do that? Yeah, I, I'll get in shotgun. <laughs> wow, remote control. This is cool. <laughs> I didn't know you could do this. There's a little bit of a lag, but it's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. So, so, um, so you said you saw some left temporal spikes. Is that right? That's right. Yep. Uh -huh. uh, and and and, um, and just that alone and the MTS. You think that's good enough? Um, I'm not really sure, but I think we should go ahead and take, take out the left turn for lobe. Uh, is she right-handed? She is right-handed, yep. Is she normal intelligence? Pretty normal, yep. Uh, so, you know, left temporal lobectomy, it's a, you know, it's nothing to sneeze at. Uh, we do them all the time, but you gotta be, gotta be sure you're doing what you're, you want to be doing. Oh, look at that. There's something. Gee, oh. who'd have thunk? I think I missed uh, it completely. There seems to be some sort of change right about here. Mm. Suddenly there's the appearance of this rhythmic theta activity with kind of a sharpish kind of contour to it, maximal at T2 uh, mm -hmm. or equipotential across T, uh, T2, T4. Mm -hmm. um, you don't see it as well up here in the, in the longitudinal run, but if you boost the gain a little bit, mm -hmm. you can hallucinate anyway. And something we like to do is hallucinate in the EEG lab. <laughs> um, you can hallucinate that there's maybe something subtle changing right about here, which correlates pretty well with what's happening here. Where, mm. where, where would you put the, the unequivocal electrographic beginning? Yeah, so that's a great question, Brandon. And um, I would put it right where my cursor is, right here. Mm. Um, okay. And I think I think the um, I think for people who are thinking about how to read EEGs when, when there are seizures underway or seizures at stake is, is to really discipline yourself to try to put your finger on the spot that's the first unequivocal ictal electrographic change. So there are four adjectives there. First, unequivocal, mm -hmm. ictal, and electrographic. And you gotta meet all four of those criteria, hopefully at the same place. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you can force yourself to put your finger there, you're usually going to get it right. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the way you the way you end up doing it practically is you find okay, so here there seems to be something happening. You work your way backwards and say, where's yeah. the first time that I see something different? So you go on a little further and see how this thing develops, and now it's unequivocally a seizure. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot of muscle artifact, but that that doesn't prevent you from seeing what's happening here. That there's rhythmic. Uh, uh, sharper, high amplitude activity emerging and it's evolving. And that's the second point or the next point to make is the evolution is a part of the criteria for calling it a seizure. Uh, so seizures typically evolve in amplitude and frequency. So you could say, okay, so they evolve just like, you know, just like we evolve, right? Slowly. Hopefully. But, uh, um, but, but how do they evolve? Mm -hmm. Do they always get bigger and bigger? Does the amplitude always go up? Do mm -hmm. they always get faster and faster? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. You can have evolution in either direction with respect to uh, frequency and probably with respect to amplitude too. And sometimes well, they evolve bi-directionally. In other words, they get bigger and bigger and faster and faster for a while. And then they get smaller and smaller and slower and slower. Uh, and then they may pick up again. But you do want to see some suggestion of evolution. Would you be willing to sing the sound of a seizure that's getting bigger and bigger and faster and faster? <laughs> well, I'm not much of a singer, um, but uh, uh, 
Uh, let me just think about it. Thank you. That was awesome. How about one that slows down? <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> All right. So uh, we were going for an Emmy with a with a TV show here, but we got to go for a Grammy now too for the music. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Cole, I have a question. Can we go back to the first unequivocal electrographic change there? So if it's at T1 and T2, what side is it coming from if, if, there's, uh, if it's T1 and T2? Well, that's a great question, but it's an easy one. Um, so this coronal ring going around the, from the vertex around to T1 and then across underneath the chin over to T2 and back up to the vertex, uh, was developed, as far as I know, in Montreal uh, by the by the, the MNI team. The beauty of it is that uh, the phase reversal is either above or below the T1, T2 electrode. Mm -hmm. If it's above, it's on the left. If it's below, it's on the right. Now, what you want to see to back that up, it, and it's much less sensitive for a couple reasons, is the simultaneous appearance of it in the temporal run here, mm -hmm. uh, the longitudinal temporal run. And... You know, unlike you modern guys, I'm a big fan of bipolar electrodes and bipolar recording. I know a lot of people now would rather look at reference. I can't see a darn thing on references myself, but um, but the bipolar is very clear. I know that, uh, you know, it all depends on what you're trained with and different people get comfortable with different ones. One's not better than the other. It's just personal preference. Kind of interesting is we spent a lot of time talking about this seizure. We've only looked at the first page. Yeah, but you know what? That's all you really need to look at. That's all Fabio looked at, apparently, but he looked at a different page. He only found the left-sided ones. But, but, but it's an important point is that 90% of your energy should go into looking at the first 10 or 20 seconds of the seizure. Yeah. 5% should go into looking at the rest of the seizure because it doesn't matter so much. The one thing that does matter a little bit is if there's focal postictal slowing, because that's a pretty reliable sign of where the problem comes from. Um, and I know uh, fellows starting out, you know, writing their first reports, they write these long descriptions of the behavioral correlates, and then the patient looked to the left, and then he coughed and sputtered, and then he grunted, and then the nurse came in, and then the left leg twitched, and then his eye eyebrows went up, and by now you're three minutes into this. Who cares? It doesn't matter. It has nothing to do with what we're trying to accomplish. Right. A good point. But in case there is something interesting, uh, what we see is actually just validation that indeed this is a seizure. Indeed, it's clearly on the right, right. Uh, essentially unilateral, and it stops abruptly, mm -hmm. uh, as seizures often do. And notice, in comparison to the previous page, notice the evolution. So it got faster and big and bigger a little bit, but then it slows down and gets really big in this case, mm -hmm. and it's at about two hertz, and then it stops. And I mentioned the word postictal slowing before, so here's a whole bunch of it, mm -hmm. uh, mainly on the right side, although there's also abnormality on the left, and some of this may be movement, so we have to be a little careful. Now, mm -hmm. there's one of those spikes that you wanted to take out, Fabio. How are you feeling about that today? Not too well. <laughs> I think, actually, I was looking at it while you were talking, Dr. Bo. I think I think I saw a left side of seizure. And um, just get into your point of how we can help this patient out. Um, if they're bi bilateral temporal independent seizures, we probably can't do anything, right? We can just do medication, right? And there's nothing else we can do. Well, that's that's um, that's a little nihilistic. Uh, there are some things we can do. How well they work is a subject for discussion. Yeah, so if you demonstrated conclusively that this patient had bilateral independent temporal lobe seizures, you can't operate it and remove or destroy both temporal lobes. Right. Uh, that would make a, for, for him, whoever this is, into an HM. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but what could you do? Well, you could take out one of the temporal lobes mm -hmm. uh, and you could use a stimulator on the other side. Mm -hmm. uh, you could stimulate both sides and see what happens and reserve the removal of one side for the future. Mm -hmm. And we actually have debates about this. What's the algorithm? That. Do, you, do you take out one and stimulate the other? Do you take out one, see what happens, and then stimulate the other if it's still causing trouble? Mm -hmm. Do you stimulate both and hope that that solves the problem, which doesn't seem to happen all that often, mm -hmm. uh, at least not 100%. Um, so, so there are those different options, and I don't think anyone has developed a, a well-codified game plan in this scenario. 
but I guess in this case, uh, we've only had two seizures so far, if, if I'm, if that's, if we're counting right. So yeah. I think we recommend continuing to monitor and at least get, uh, you know, four to six, which are magical numbers um, of seizures before we decide. Right. What do you think? That sounds well, good. There's certainly no harm in that. And uh, you might wonder where this four to six idea comes from. And Bob Fisher taught me a long time ago where it comes from. It comes from the basics of if you flip a coin multiple times, how many times do you have to flip it before you conclude that it's a, 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 a coin with two heads? Hmm. Um, and if you think about it statistically, if you flip it once and it comes up heads, the next time you flip it, it's got a 50-50 chance of coming up heads again, and the same thing the next time, the next time, the next time. Mm -hmm. What's the chance that all five times it will come up heads? Well, actually, when you do the math, that's about uh, that's less than 90, that's less than 5%. Mm -hmm. So when you think about statistical distributions, uh, that's that's sort of where we start to say, okay, this is you know more than one or two standard deviations of unlikely, but mm -hmm. so that's where the five figure comes from. Thanks for coming. I think you 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 helped this patient out uh, by protecting him from Fabio. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Dr. Paul. Well, that was fun. We should that's do this fun. again. Yeah. Always invited. <laughs>